Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Please sit. Uh, thank you, Minister, and it's a real uh, privilege and honor to be here this morning uh, to work with you on this uh, training uh, exercise, and it's uh, doubly a pleasure to be working with you as a politician and as a public figure, and I think there's no doubt uh, great things are in store for you and great things are in store for our country because of your work, and part of that is what is happening over the next three weeks here. I want to thank the assessors for their work in the planning and execution of this. And uh, I'm sure, looking at all the faces here, that uh, the public service is assured a good future as you absorb uh, all that is said and taught during these next few weeks. I was listening very carefully to my school friend, Bishop Swan. So I wanted to see if he could actually sing. And then I forgot that he is, in fact, a pastor. Is he still here? He's the door. Oh, he's mounting the door. Well, uh, what I wanted to say was, uh, when, I, when he was singing the national anthem, that Arthur Hanna, when he was governor general of our country, used to always listen very carefully to the national anthem and how it was sung. And... Uh, he was very traditional with this, and if you deviated from the way Timothy Gibson wrote it, he would walk up to the singer and say, well, you sounded very nice, that was good. Uh, unfortunately, you didn't sing the national anthem. <laughs> but this was by the script, the, na the national anthem, without any deviations. <laughs> so I say that to you, those of you who are, well, you're all public servants, so you know that you're the guardians of the rules and the traditions and all the rest of it. So when they start deviating all over the place, you know uh, what, what, the, what you're supposed to uh, be hearing or doing. And uh, I start off because the minister indicated that I was public service minister before. And one of the things that impressed me, we were elected in May of 2002. <laughs> which is shortly before independence celebrations take place in July. And uh, our system is quite brutal. Uh, you get elected, there's no transition period like the United States. So you get elected on election day, uh, at midnight the clock changes and the next day you're changed from ordinary citizen to public figure or minister or prime minister. And you get into a system which is running, up and running. And that system is responsible for making sure that the country is running and running smoothly. So much of when, when you get there, much of what you have to do, the routine of it, is already decided for you. And it's being run by the public service. Merlin Reese was um, the shadow minister for labor when I was a student at the University of London. And uh, he was telling us the, uh, that the public service has a had a responsibility to know what the policies of both the opposition and the government are or were. That's the way their system worked in the UK. And he said, because what happens is, given the brutality of our systems and the change, uh, the public servants have to know what are the policies that the new government uh, intends to implement. So they should read the manifestos of both political parties and know what they're expected to adopt as soon or as there is a change, if there is a change. But what impressed me when I became minister was the fact that with independence coming up, all the planning had already been done for independence. There was a committee in place, the permanent secretary was there, and essentially all you had to do was to show up to the event. And that's the public service at its best. What is most important is today, I use this word quite a lot, is logistics. And it's particularly important in the foreign service because timing is very important and where you're going to be on a specific day and what you're going to do and how things are going to unfold. 
but it's also a service-wide issue even in the domestic theater. Because for this to happen this morning, you couldn't just roll out of bed and say, let's show up at the Franklin Wilson Center. This had to be planned in advance to meet the tasks which will unfold over the next three weeks. So planning and logistics. And our country has a cultural problem with time, which we can't seem to surmount. Um, my colleagues in Parliament laugh at me because I tell people I go to these uh, events and I promise to spend 60 minutes with you and then I'm gone. Uh, it is an abuse of public time to stretch things out beyond what they should be. And uh, this is particularly so because you have an electorate that's demanding that public figures be everywhere at all places. And so it's important for us to be efficient in the allocation of time, starting things on time, ending them on a timely basis. So I have the story of uh, my branch. I always have this argument with them. So the meeting's supposed to start at 7 o'clock. And two minutes to seven, everybody's fidgeting around. And seven o'clock comes. And I say, well, let's start the meeting. Uh, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna start in a few minutes. I said, no, you're not gonna, you're gonna start the meeting now. It's seven o'clock. You know, there's no, there's no delay. There's no putting off. If you tell people seven a.m., it means seven a.m. And you start seven a.m. But in order to do that, you have to make sure that things are set so that you can start at 7 a.m. And I'm sure you all have the experience of being at one function or the next, and the food is coming in through the back door and all kinds of things going on, but it's not set. So that means you really have to, if you're going to start at 7 a.m., that means things have to be set by 6 a.m. in order to start at 7 a.m. So I leave that with you. Uh, the Constitution is going to be the focus of your initial discussions because that's the bedrock from which we all operate. And I went and looked at it this morning because there are two provisions I wanted to point out to you. One is Section 72, or Article 72 as it's properly called, and the other is Article 88. So Article 72, uh, speaks to the cabinet of the Bahamas being the executive arm of the government of the Bahamas. And that means that the cabinet sits and makes the decisions about how the laws and policies are going to be executed. That's the central brain of the country, so to speak. And I try to tell people who are not public servants that nothing will happen in terms of execution of policy unless the public servant sees what's called a cabinet conclusion, which means that the cabinet has sat, made a decision, and the conclusion is the summary of what that decision is. And that's how things work. And so it is going to be strengthened by cabinet paper writing, because that is another issue which is the bane of uh, and complaint of many ministers, which is um, how do you get a cabinet paper written? And uh, what does the cabinet paper contain? And how does the uh, conclusion reflect what is in the cabinet paper? I was. Uh, I think I was having, a, there was a minister discussing with the Secretary of the Cabinet the other day, some paper, and uh, the Secretary of the Cabinet said, well, we only reflected what was in the paper. So you have to, if, when, when the minister is trying to get a policy done, you've got to accurately reflect what you actually want done. And um, politicians have to avoid prime ministers changing conclusions, make sure that uh, before you leave the table, that you and he and uh, are all agreed on what the conclusion is supposed to be. 
So that's the cabinet. The second one I wanted was Article 88. So Article 88 uh, talks about the appointment of ministers. And it says that ministers are responsible for the direction and control. Direction and control are the two words they use. And then there is a, a, a permanent secretary who has the supervision of the department. And I looked at those words very carefully. So that means that the minister actually is the person who tells what happens in the ministry in executing the policies. But this is all supervised by the permanent secretary. Two, diff two different levels. And I used to have this fight with one of the permanent secretaries in my early days. And we were standing up on the steps, and she was challenging me on something. And I said, well, you know, here's the way it works. I'm not smarter than you. I'm not richer than you. <laughs> I'm not better than you. I'm the minister, and you're the permanent secretary. So the minister gets to decide, and the permanent secretary gets to carry out. And so that's how we ended that. Fortunately, we were both from Baintown, or descendants of Baintown, so we understood each other quite quickly. <laughs> The other provision I wanted to point out was the Public Service Commission. The Public Service Commission, I think, is little understood in the country because both of us as ministers have this experience. I need to get promoted. And since you're the Public Service Minister, I need you to get me promoted. But all of you who work in the public service know, and, and the reason I'm saying it now is because I'd like the country to know, is that the public service minister and the minister of state, we do not promote anybody. We don't have any power to promote anyone. We may have influence, but no power or authority to do so. That is vested in the Public Service Commission. And its chair is Father Moultrie, as you heard. And as you know, the process begins within ministries themselves. They make the recommendations. The recommendations are advanced to the Public Service Ministry, which prepares the, the, pro, the it, it uh, puts, prepares the actual, I don't want to say application, but prepares the file to go to the Public Service Commission for the Public Service Commission to pronounce based on the policies which are established by the Cabinet. And the Cabinet can change those policies. So, for example, you will find that uh, many people complain that you need academic qualifications to get promoted. And in some cases, the Public Service Ministry has been able to design with the Cabinet changes to those policies, which allow people who have been working in a particular area over a period of time to use that experience to count toward promotions. And that's helped uh, a lot to move the process forward. The Public Service Commission is unfortunately under-resourced. And that is one of the issues which the Minister of State is working on now. And part of the uh, bringing on the assessors is to review all of these issues and to see what we can do to try and move these things along. Because it's really been quite sad that there haven't been assessment exercises for such a long time. And the cabinets recently agreed for the purposes of some of these exercises, the general promotions exercise, that for the time being those assessments will not be required so we can move that process forward. Otherwise, we'd just be stuck. There are 20,000 public servants, give or take, and it's just uh, catching up is just now an impossible task. Grafton Eiffel used to be Assistant Commissioner of Police. And when I was a reporter, he and I were talking in Grand Bahama. And he told me that one of the magics about the success of the Royal Bahamas Police Force is that every year the police force tries to get a cohort of recruits for the year that they graduate from school. And he said like this, the good guys in that class know the bad guys in the class. So we have to get the good guys on the force because they know how their fellows deal and act. 
and I adopted that more generally to the public service. It was a mistake to have a moratorium on hiring, no matter how tough the economic situation is. Every year, the public service should get from the graduating class persons to come into the public service and be trained. It's the only way to keep up with how the country is progressing. So you may reduce the numbers, but you need to recruit every year so that you get from each cohort a sample across the country of people so that uh, that's, that's the way the country will grow and the, and the service will grow. So I commend that to you as well. And to make this final point about the more general uh, mission of Mrs. Glover Rowe, which is to enhance the human resources component of the public service. Uh, we find, as ministers of the government, that people leapfrog over everybody, including the permanent secretary, and come directly to us to find out why they haven't been promoted, why have they haven't been assessed, why a particular decision was made to transfer or make other provisions, and uh, the forward movement of people's careers. So this has been my, my most, uh, I'm most experienced with the developments in the Foreign Service, so that you have people who are acting at uh, high-level executive jobs who are, in fact, substantively in the public service at an entry level. And that's because just the, these processes were not followed, were abandoned, uh, and nobody, it seems, will sit with an employee and say, this is how you're doing, this is not how you're doing, uh, you need to do this, or you need to, you know, this is, this is why these things are going on. So, again, we're trying to see whether or not we can solve this problem. Uh, with Mrs. Glover role at trying to implement a publicly, uh, a properly resourced human resources area in the government. And hopefully this will make things a lot better going forward. So that's a lot on the plates of all of us. Uh, I always use this opportunity as a politician to say I prefer 10 years as opposed to five years. Uh, I think that uh, it's a disservice is done to a country by this five years this way, five years that way, you know. And so we had a golden era, in my view, when we had 25 years of continuous administration because the country was more stable going forward. But the country is a democratic country, and voters have their choices. And it's the job of the public service, of course, to work neutrally with whoever comes to lead the country. Uh, and make sure that it goes in the right direction. Hopefully, there is a kind of unanimous agreement and consent of both sides about the general direction and control of the country so that there's not too much of this back and forth, even if there is a political change. But I hope that we are the guardians of this change going forward. I thank uh, Mrs. Glover Roll for her help and work and leadership, and to all of you for availing yourselves of this opportunity. The Prime Minister deeply appreciates the work of all public servants and will do the best we can to make sure that the public service is properly resourced, properly trained, and properly led. I wish you all the best in this assessment exercise. Thank you.